do that. So we're on the recording live. I see people starting to join us. So welcome as you're coming in and joining the webinar here. Um, Rachel, before you popped on, I was um, congratulating and talking to Piper about when we had her here in 2022 um, and all the fun stuff that was happening with the with, the, with that book. So fun yeah. stuff to have her back. That was such a good book. The Anlo book. So good. Yes. So good. So um, part of my little intro there. But um, while people are getting settled in, this is my standard question. It's the, it's the, <laughs> it's the space filler, as they say. Um, yeah. Always like to know, I think we know where Rachel's calling in from, but Rachel, <laughs> you're, co you're coming in from- I'm in Toronto, Canada. Yay. <laughs> and what's so the weather? You know, we're going to start having some rain here in San Diego. It's just tomorrow. rainy. Just rainy. Just rainy. Yeah. Yep. And Piper, Typical you April. are coming in from- Atlanta. Okay. <laughs> Here's my question to you. Are you part of the path of totality for the eclipse? Uh, we're too far south, but it's about, it seems to be about 80% here. We're okay. getting about 80 in Toronto. Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Not quite full on, but yeah. <laughs> Cause that's the, that's the big talk. Yeah. But apparently it's going to be rainy all day. Like we're now realizing we might oh not God. see anything. <laughs> I'll come in like covering it all up. So. <laughs> but I think that what I think that you'll get though is you'll still get that dusk feeling though. Yeah. I yeah. still think because that's always the weirdest part of that thing. It's just like, um, oh, so hi Renee. I love it when people pop in and tell us where they're calling from. So Renee is back in. Hi, Renee, we love hi. having you join us. You join us all the time. Brenda's here from oh, British Kalona. Columbia. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so it's always fun to hear where everybody's coming from. So just for those of you that may not know, Warwick's is located in San Diego, just uh, La Jolla, just a little bit north of downtown San Diego. Um, and so I will be putting into the comment section or the, the chat here, um, how to buy America. Let's see, do we have the cover? Yeah. Oh, yes. Daughters. There it is. American Daughters. Such a great cover. Yeah. So I'll be putting that into the chat. Um, Rachel and Piper are going to talk for about 30, 35 ish minutes. So at the bottom of your screen is the Q&A button. I know that a lot of you already know this, but I have to do my due diligence mm -hmm. and tell people. Um, pop your questions into the Q&A section and um, I'll come back in and pop those into the conversation a little bit um, after they're done with their wonderful talk. So I have to do my job and introduce these two wonderful authors. So um, where were we? One second, because I don't know what just happened to my screen, but there we go. <laughs> so Piper G. Hughley's biographical historical fiction by her own design, a novel of Anne Lowe, fashion designer to the social register, which we had in 2022 here, tells the inspiring story of the black fashion designer of Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress. By her own design for 2020, now stay with me, everybody, because this is some good stuff. <laughs> in 2022 was a book list top 100 editors choice selection. Name one of the top 100 books in Canada by the Globe and Mail newspaper and was selected as the historical fiction winner by the American Library Association Reading Council. Congratulations on all of that. Thank you. is a literature professor of, uh, at Clark Atlanta University and blogs about history behind her novels at piperhugley.com. So we're going to talk about how to keep track of her um, a little bit later um, on where her social media is and book clubs and all kinds of stuff. She's here today to talk about American Daughters, the story of the decades long interracial friendship between Alice Roosevelt and Portia Washington, the rebel teenage daughters of President Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, respectively. And joining her today is the wonderful Rachel McMillan. Rachel is the author of several historical novels, mystery and romance series, as well as nonfiction. <laughs> She's also an agent, and in her spare time, she does these amazing interviews, lifting up untold number of authors. So in other words, she is a busy, busy, busy lady. So, so with that, ladies, have a wonderful conversation, and I'll see you in about a half hour. Thank Thanks you so much. Hi, Piper. It's nice to see you. I got to meet Piper in real life in Chicago last year at um, American Library Association, which was so fun. Um Piper, this is your second work of uh, biographical fiction after the Anne Lowe novel. Um, uh, let's start by, uh, how did writing by her own design prepare you for writing American Daughters? 
Um, I think in sort of the notion of just how to take a look at the events in someone's life that would make for good story um, in, in terms of that. But I, I have been working on um, a lot of stuff in terms of this particular uh, individual in the United States, Booker T. Washington, and his family. I've been looking at that before and the Ann Loth thing kind of happened on Twitter. <laughs> so it was like a, a happenstance where I was like taking a break from the stuff that I was originally doing um, in, in terms of Booker T. Washington, which I've been doing research uh, regarding that family now for going on a decade, actually, <laughs> in terms of that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, Anne Lowe's, the book by her own design gave me an opportunity, I feel, to get my foot in the door in regards yeah. to this kind of, uh, fiction and hopefully we'll see if others. Sure. Sure. Um, and Piper, actually, can you tell everybody the Twitter story? Because I love it, but they might not know it. Um, so there are many different ways that authors are meeting with editors and books, get pitched and books get signed. Can you talk a little bit about how the Anne Lowe story by her own design started? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, part of it is I had independently published two historical romance series um, over time, over the years, um, because I had wanted to establish some credibility as a writer of historical fiction. Um, and I would see, you know, editors at conferences, uh, that I would attend very often. So that also helped. I, I you know, that was yeah, also yeah. part of it in terms of um, the setup per se. But um, yeah, so my editor uh, had a habit of retweeting out articles about people, historical events, something like that, that she um, would not mind seeing novels about. Um, and I knew this because one of my friends had gotten a contract that way. So when I saw her tweet out an article about Anne Lowe, she said, she retweeted it out and said, who would like to write this novel for me? And I knew who Anne Lowe was because I'd been a long time Kennedy aficionado. Um, I've, I've done a lot of study in terms of the presidents, et cetera, um, but in particular, uh, John F. Kennedy and Jacqueline. So I knew who Enlo was, but I didn't know what her story was. So I looked at the article and I looked at some other things on the internet and I said, ah, that's a story. That is the kind of thing whereby, because not every person in history would make for a good biographical historical fiction yeah. but Anne Lowe's life events as I came to understand them in that brief time would so um and particularly when I'm this big how big of a nerd I am when I saw her death date I knew instantly that that was the day after Charles Diana had gotten engaged so it instantly the prologue came to my mind to say what if she's somewhere in bed and she's ill and she's dying and she's feeling this great amount of regret about not being able to have that commission or even be able to witness that commission wow. because she knew that she was dying. And so I wrote the prologue, but what basically ended up being the prologue and sent it to my agent and said, tell her I am on this and not to let anybody else near it. So. I love that. Um, and yes, I'm glad you mentioned your other historical fiction because it was my next little uh, aside here was that people know you from By Her Own Design. It was acclaimed and it was lauded and it was known everywhere. But Piper has actually been writing for a very, very long time. And you can find her historical romances. And I that's how I first discovered her before I connected with her on Twitter is because I was a fan of those books. So go and find them. They're wonderful. Um, and they're a little bit different because now she's writing about people who actually existed and bringing that history to the forefront. Um, if you don't know a lot about Piper, you should know that she's also an academic. So she comes across the research um, very naturally because it's a huge part of her day job. So I like to ask this question in terms of biographical fiction, where does the research end and the creativity begin? Or do you even know if there's a stop and start? 
Yeah, I don't know because uh, well, who, there were two Jackie biographies that got published last year, and I just, you know, I'm reading them. You know, I always read, go and read. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. that book's been published, but I still am reading. <laughs> Looking to see if Anne Liz mentioned or how she's mentioned. It doesn't really stop ever um, in terms of that. Um, you know, again, part of it is that you're looking for events that would make a good story. Uh, the story is a prior the priority, even though these are real life people, because life is episodic. So you can't tell it in terms of episodes, but you have to tell what would make for good narrative um, in terms of that. So that's the that's the way in which I look at the events in a, a life and how they might work in terms of what somebody's goals would be, their motivation, um, and what would be conflicts in their life that, in terms of the things that get people really interested and invested in a story and rooting for a particular character in terms of that. So I think for both Portia and Alice in American Daughters, that was made easy because of what they had in common, not how they differed racially, yeah, but what they, they had in common as these two young women who lost their mothers at tragically early ages. Um, Alice's mother died when she was two days old. Uh, it, it's a, you know, aspect of Theodore Roosevelt's life that uh, he was in the um, state legislature and had uh, told and telegraphed to come home right away. He came to the house and his brother opened the door and said, there is a curse on this house because on one floor of the house, his wife is dying and another floor of the house, his mother was dying and he was running back and forth between them. Um, as they both now, didn't he isn't there a letter or a journal entry yeah. about this is so powerful because I've read it before and just wow because we yeah. think of this big figure who you know uh, sometimes embodies this very typical masculinity you know we've yeah. all seen the pictures of him like riding a moose or whatever <laughs> and like like he is like he, is even Teddy he, Roosevelt. Has, he has a certain kind of presence in terms of the yeah kind of guy or whatever who had this terribly tragic thing happen uh to him and there's this little baby girl of all things right um and of course you know they do the you know thing that they did back then and named the girl after her mother who died and then he made he makes this vow not to say that name so then how do you like as a person grow and become to know who you are etc without that guiding force of a mother and nobody is saying your name you know and so that was one thing and then Portia had a similar kind of absence in her life not once uh, when her biological mother died when she was 11. But again, when the woman who became her stepmother died when she was six. So it was like this double loss, you know, that they had. And it, it's like the kind of thing that, like I said, that people would be able to see that and be like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen to that person. Or how do they get out from under daddy's shadow in, in terms of that? Or have the situation where their fathers, both of them, being these great statesmen who were ambitious, kind of put those girls to the side in, you know, a lot of ways because they were girls, you know, and, uh, for one thing, and they're grieving for another, you know, to be raised in that kind of with a cloud of grief uh, over you um, at the same time. And, and this is when I found out about their, their friendship, um, I, I, I said, well, of course they they would be friends because th these that was such a powerful force in terms of um thinking about how someone copes in the world, how do they get started in the world? They were already starting at a deficit, even as they're incredibly Alice being incredibly privileged, of course, and even Portia um, as a Black person in America because her father was the most famous Black man of his day in the United States. So, yeah, it, it makes sense that they would be friends. So it's looking at those things in terms of what would make 
somewhat a relatable character in terms of a, a story, the thing, kind of thing that I look for in terms of a biographical, historical fiction and project. First. It's amazing because you have the privilege of historical hindsight. You know that these women lived amazing lives in a way that as we're reading their story, they don't know this about themselves. And I find that so interesting, the dramatic mm -hmm. irony of you you know what happens to them and the amazing legacy they live beyond, as you said, the shadow of their famous fathers. Um, and I was going to ask, but I, I just think it's a moot point now because you've mentioned that you were working on Booker T. Washington and his family for a long time mm -hmm. um, because it was just about, uh, but I think you had a, also had a really good starting grounding point did you ensure that your research focused mainly on Alice and Portia? Because I could see how it would get overwhelming if you wanted to learn everything about Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, because there's so much yeah. um, about both of them out there. Yeah, no, I, I did. And this, it really was not hard for me because men get they get stuff all the time, so. <laughs> Especially these two. I mean, they wrote yeah. about themselves. They ever, everyone wrote about them. I'm, I'm um, like, not... Brian Kilmeade published a joint biography of them. I mean, they, you know, dudes get stuff all the time. Yeah, and it's not diminishing their influence. It's just, no. they're out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's why I just thought it was amazing because this is an incredible, uh, and we'll talk later about how you can request for Piper to zoom into your book club and you can talk one-on-one -on -one about any questions you have. This would be an amazing book club book because what we really are seeing is the lesser known extension of two iconic, iconic figures in American history. These aren't just two men who had amazing lives. They're men who people have very very strong opinions mm -hmm. about not only much more than a century later but also within their time periods mm -hmm. everyone had opinions about them um did you give your self permission to override points of history that perhaps didn't serve the story or to supplement facts you couldn't find i mean People cannot expect all of us to be doctorates in everything that we research. And I know you're very, very attuned to making it as research driven as possible. But how did you reconcile the fact that, yes, I'm going to have to fill in a few blanks here just because they're not here to walk me through it? Yeah, well, they're not here. And then there's not as much information about their friendship. I think because they were different racially. Yeah. It's not a publicly known friendship. So a lot of what I had to do was to see and think about what places or what times would it make sense for them to overlap and or correspond with one another. And I'll be in just way at one point they don't see each other for like 13 years or something like that. At what point it makes sense? Because that that information's not there to us so a lot of that was story that I had to create in terms of that and that's what it's a historical fiction that's yeah. what it is but the other aspect in terms of um whereby for this genre you have permission for it as you know is to have the authors note in the back in order to be able to indicate and say the places where you had to fictionalize or for one particular instance I needed Portia to be someplace where she wasn't necessarily, that all goes in there in terms of explaining, um, you know, whatever to, to people who, who might be reading uh, the, the book or the story. And it could be, you know, like the regular readers are not like really caring in terms of that. No, that. they just want the story, but there's always going to be one dude on the internet. There's always going to be one dude. And for that dude, it's just like, it's for, yeah. So it's like CYA, you know, covering or whoever. <laughs> saying, yes, I know the force was not at this particular place at the time, but I had to put it there for the dramatic part of the story. So <laughs> yeah, you're serving, as you mentioned, the narrative. People's lives are episodic. You're serving the narrative. And I think the, the best thing about historical fiction and the best thing about this is hopefully it will inspire people who maybe didn't know a ton about Roosevelt or Booker T. Washington mm -hmm. outside of maybe what they've 
read about in school or to, to pursue it a little bit more. Um, and one of the things that I really loved because I loved by her own design is, you know, Anne Lois' story is so wonderfully tactile, right? Mm -hmm. We've got the memory of what she left behind, um, the Jackie O dress, Olivia de Havilland's dress. Mm -hmm. Here we have women that to many of us were unfamiliar. So I know that you had researched Booker T. Washington's family. How did Alice cross your path? Was it in relation to reading about the Washingtons or? Um, well, as I said, I, I, I have like this thing with presidents. I kind of. <laughs> you and my dad, my dad loves U.S. presidents. He's always reading a biography I, of one I, of them. Like, you're the a foreign country and stuff like that. So, so I, oh, probably, he's so obsessed. It's probably your father being Canadian, <laughs> being this little black girl from Pittsburgh. It's probably just on the same level of weirdness in terms of. <laughs> it's just so unexpected. Every time I'm home, he's got like three yeah. biographies of American presidents. Mm -hmm. Like he knows yeah. more about Lincoln than some Americans, I swear. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Yeah, no, so. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so I, I just kind of knew but here in the united states at least alice as a, a president's child and, and this was something she talked about before um in terms of her fame whereby people were writing songs about her she had a color uh it's not this kind of blue it's more like a periwinkle but it was called alice blue where people were writing dresses in it in terms of that her the way in which she was this real life iteration of um what was called a gibson girl at that particular point in time she just was like was able to like hook into that and a lot of people were very obsessed with her at a time when hollywood did not yet exist so there was like this void for celebrity to happen and she filled it in terms of who she was. So all of those particular influences of who she was, the color, the song or whatever is, you know, it's there in, in terms of um, American culture, um, et cetera, as this, you know, kind of first iteration of somebody who, uh, like I said, people were obsessed with uh, a law like the Kardashians or something like that. You know, this is like a real kind of not like a, a, a like a reality show that you know they didn't have TV yeah. back then, but it's like people were like had looming questions about her life and say this daughter of this powerful man who you know openly and you know <laughs> and sometimes very publicly rebelled against him as he said you know I can either run the country or I can control Alice but I cannot possibly do both at the same time you know where she's out acting out in all of these ways um, that for her what is she going to do who's going to be the guy that she marries what's going to happen to her in terms of her marital life, which made her as a celebrity made for good copy in newspapers, you know, all the other little stories about her carrying a snake in her bag so that people wouldn't come too close to her or something like that. Or him, you know, saying when she was smoking, he said, there will be no smoking under this roof. And she goes up on the roof in order to smoke <laughs> all these things, you know, in terms of that. And, you know, she supposedly had this little pillow that said, if you don't have something nice to say about someone, come and sit by me kind of thing. They call her the other Washington Monument. All of those, like the first 80 years of the 20th century, she's like this looming presence in the Capitol. And like I said, this long-term like celebrity uh, kind of person about whom I think had a lot of pain and a lot of oh, and the pre the pressure. I can't imagine I... the pressure. And sure. talking sure. about celebrity, and I can't remember where I read, but I know that Booker T. Washington was one of the most photographed black was men Douglas, who was the most photographed Douglas. Man. okay sorry i knew that but i that's mm -hmm. sorry about that but um just the idea of celebrity and of these black educated men right who became an incredibly new visibility to 
uh, a major portion of the population that had yeah. been largely diminished and ignored. And then for Portia to the, the responsibility and pressure, both of these women must exactly. have had not only Oh, Frederick Douglass. Yes. He's, he fascinates me too. He's so fascinating. Um, and I, I apologize for mixing them up, but, uh, <laughs> but both Alice and Portia, not only are motherless daughters yes. growing up under the shadow of these um, men, but they also bear the restriction of their respective time periods, the limitations placed on women yes. and, you know, they both of them, Portia especially, you, you dive into the fact that the, her marriage was as much a threat to her liberty yeah. as her time period. You know, yeah. and the the intelligence and creativity that she had that was downplayed by mm -hmm. this man and the echoes of the circumstances these women had just from growing up in the time period they did. So I don't think that was a question as much as a comment in that you just, you, you yes. have helped bring them out of their reputation and their influence. And they in turn become an extension of the legacy that their fathers were building, but in such an amazing way. Portia helps preserve her father's legacy in many ways. Yes. Um, and Alice through her long life, maintains political contacts and is yeah. very involved in activism. Do you feel that we are destined to testify in our own way and bear witness to our heritage, whether or not it is something we are, you know, if whether or not we grow up in a nice household or a bad situation, is there something that compels us that we have to testify and bear witness to this? Because these women did not have all altogether great home lives. Right. And they they kept yeah. their father's legacies alive. I, mm -hmm. I just was really interested in your capture of that. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, at least in terms of my own particular background. I do think that that's true. Um, and I recall like answering some interview questions for someone and someone said, uh, I said to them, like, well, cause you don't know like with the pressure that you often feel like from your parents or whatever. And um, the woman said, well, not everybody has that. I was like, oh, I guess not. But I, I was someone who yeah. <laughs> <You know, laughs> like, <laughs> thought this was someone just yesterday in terms of like all the ways in which I was like this little odd uh, person in the bosom of my family. Is uh, my father's a trained opera singer, and my mother uh, accompanied him, and they would go around town and sing their in their beautiful voices at churches and weddings and all this other kind of stuff. And I can't carry a tune. Uh, and everybody in my family was tall and the short one, you know, and so there's like all of these ways in which I really related on some level to Alice and Portia and the pressures that they had in terms of their father, certainly not able to relate, like you're saying, to the fact of their motherless circumstances. And let's not forget the evil stepmothers that come in. Uh, as a There's a reason Disney always has evil stepmothers. <laughs> <laughs> You know, where Alice and you know, the stepmother is telling her, you know, on her way day, I'm going to come glad to see you go. You know, kind of thing, you know, just not even like trying to hide um, the hostility that exists, you know, um, in terms of that. So I, I, I just, you know, that pressure, what is that in, in terms of you carrying forward your, the, whatever your parents put into you or whatever. And as, as outrageous as Alice is, there's still always like a, a ceiling on her behavior. Oh, that's a great, that's a yeah. great visual for her. And yeah. I love that you mentioned your musical heritage because we've talked music before. And one of the things I loved and that I previously didn't know before this book was Portia's interest in preserving the tradition of spirituals, mm -hmm. as well as having the knowledge of classical music. So yeah. she is able to preserve not only the history of her father's legacy in ways, but the history of 
an entire genre of music yeah. that yeah. she can notate in a way that might have been lost forever. How much, I, I can imagine on some level, it must have been just a little bit of fun to go through all that. How, how much time did you spend on falling down the rabbit hole of this aspect of course? Well, it, it's what I was brought up with, my father being a classical oh. musician and a scholar of spiritual. I love it. It is in my own way, a way to extend his legacy via paying tribute to Portia Washington, who was someone who um, was a forerunner so that he could do what he did, right? And, and so, you know, the, sort of the ways in which um, people here don't sort of tend to think about uh, Booker T. Washington as his focus on what Black Americans could do is being this very narrow, limited kind of way. But I intend, I, I prefer to look at what he allowed Portia to do. How he Oh, I love that, yeah. To go to Europe and to be educated beyond Tuskegee at these, you know, predominantly white colleges where she was the only Black student and all that. It was like in his children, he could see the future potential of the race and backed it. Um, and so, as I say, all of these classical musicians, these Black classical musicians who exist, owe a debt to Portia Washington in terms of her being a forerunner for doing those things. All of the ones that follow, Marian Anderson and Jesse Norman and Kathleen Battle and you know, people like my father who that's what he studied and um, practiced all of his life. So, mm -hmm. I honestly, while reading this, and it's not that I didn't appreciate the Portia and Alice friendship story, but I kind of wanted an entire novel on Portia. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're both really fascinating, but I just, I, I, I must have been difficult at some point to cut some of it off. To yeah, well, the the limitations the lasted until Portia's death in 1978. So I end yeah. the book in 1930. There is lots there, you know, after, and there's a certain kind of aspect there before, particularly in the relationship with her stepmother, which is also written, but just not yet published um, in terms of that. I, I just want to, and I, you know, uh, sometimes I just think of things and then just <laughs> DM Piper on Twitter, like, can you do this one? <laughs> like, I'm not sure. I'm trying really hard. So, where's my sister Rosetta Thorpe biography? Where is it? <laughs> That'd be I just awesome. think she'd be an amazing fictional okay, subject. Um, because Very historical good. fiction is an amazing way that we can engage with people in a narrative. And yes. I think sometimes people stay away from writing nonfiction if they're, or reading nonfiction if they're huge readers because they think that maybe it's going to be dry or told in a way that has them use a different part of their brain. And one of the things you do really well is get us super engaged in the narrative of these women, but also their emotions, their ups and downs, there's humor, there's resilience. Mm -hmm. And as women who are still up yes. against mm -hmm. so many limitations so many things happening where men control mm -hmm. so much i think that we're all part of a lineage of we can find ourselves in either portia and alice and that it it echoes that it we really haven't changed as much as we should have. Um, I think, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I'm going to turn it back to Julie for some <laughs> questions from anybody watching. Uh, Piper is one of my favorite humans in the entire world. You have to follow her on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> Just, you have to. Um, but also, uh, Piper would be an amazing person to Skype in or Zoom into your book club. You will find a ton in this book that will make for an amazing discussion. It will not be one of the months where everybody shows up and you just drink wine and don't talk about the book. It'll be one of those ones where you actually really engage with it. So um, Piper, you're an absolute delight. I think you're one of the smartest humans I've ever met. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank well, you. with that, so Piper, where I, we'll, we're going to do this a little out of order because I want people while they're thinking about that book club stuff, where should they contact you if they want to do that with you? Um, they can contact me through my website, which is piperhugley.com and or novelnetwork.com as well. Okay, excellent. 
because I mm-hmm. um, want to make sure that people can get you get you that way too. Um, yeah. Okay, um, and so if anybody has a question, pop it into the Q and A down at the bottom there. But the couple things that I was cracking up, or not cracking, but I, that I love that you said was that not all historical fiction or historical figures make good historical fiction. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think yeah. that that's really a because we've thing. also we've all read some bio biographical fiction where it's like why. <laughs> right <laughs> like kudos to you for trying but i just not i never care really. enough about this person before <laughs> yeah not really finding it and so and, and then to your point Rachel, how much about, massaging you can do with yeah it. like we're good here wikipedia has got it covered <laughs> yeah don't really need to know much more but i love though rachel what your point too though with their relationship going from the 30s to the i mean there's so much more i mean there's, uh, these women lived big time um alice lived for freaking ever like she had a long life it's it was quite it was yeah. it, it's the perfect experience where you end the book and i just wanted more and i'd rather have that than how are there 170 pages left, left. <laughs> right it's like I, what, what else can they possibly talk about <laughs> but the readers can fill in the more by reading more about these women right yeah which and that's what historical fiction is really good for yeah and that's a there's nothing i don't think there's anything better than a book that makes you hit google yeah (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) you know it's like okay i I want more what's happening here you know so i'm naughty i start looking even i'm not done with (laughs) me too oh i did the same thing i gotta i gotta know i gotta sometimes it's just revisiting what they look like because they're not neither of them are people that i have rolling around in you know um booker t washington teddy roosevelt i kind of know what they look like i've seen them Mm -hmm. enough but um these two it was like oh what do you look like again (laughs) which goes back to my favorite thing to say no wonder it's called his (laughs) tree yeah because we we have those pictures but not the women down pat yeah and we have enough fictional representations on tv and film of booker t washington and frederick Douglass. like they're people play them we've got an idea of who they were such uh, iconic but it was just really cool yeah i never would have thought i love that you thought of this piper and i i also really love that it allowed you to explore something that had been a personal interest Yes, me too. I, I was glad to be able to to hook it in, in in terms of that, to say that all of those years of research I've been doing didn't go to waste in some ways. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Cheryl, I see your hand raised, but um, we're taking questions in the Q&A, so if you can type that in, that would be terrific. Um, <laughs> but just another real quick comment um, about the, one of the things that you said that's one of my favorite things to say anytime I'm in a party atmosphere is if you don't have something nice to say, because I think, well, didn't we get that from... Um, Olympia Dukakis and um, Steel Magnolias. I always love that. Or, or when you're talking to a friend, it's like, um, this might be mean, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no offense, but this is what I really I think. This is Boy, like, I don't mean to be mean, but it's just like, oh, there, you know, some good's coming after that. <laughs> And not to put either one of you on the spot, but I always do anyway. So, um, well, of course, American Daughters is top on the list here. But anything that either one of you are reading that um, you'd like to highlight um, for to lift up another author. So, I don't know, either one of you can start if there's something currently that you're reading that you'd like to chat about. Um, I'm super into What the Mountain Remembers by What the Mountains Remember by Joy Calloway. Um, Marriage of Convenience Story set at an amazing um hotel is she does Appalachian Southern fiction so well. And I'm also reading the Briar Club by our friend Kate Quinn that comes out oh, very soon. It is and coming out like July. It's June? 1950s, yeah. Um you got a there's copy. And then uh Ooh. yeah, a ton of research. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll lead us into before we go to your Piper. That'll lead us into what do you got coming? What's what's the most recent thing next that you've got coming up, Rachel? Because I know you got. So uh, me much- is the Liberty Scarf with Janelle Sazelski and Amy Runyon. It comes out November the fourteenth. We're just in content edits for that. Um, the cover is gorgeous. 
So, and then at some point we haven't finalized a date, but I am, uh, my Operation Scarlet will eventually come out. Uh, and it's my retelling of Scarlet Pimpernel story in World War II France. It's just one of those things. Everybody sometimes edits and books take longer. You know, sometimes it's like you think, okay, yeah, a year and then boom, boom, boom. Sometimes it just takes a little bit longer. But we can't wait for both of those. So sure. Those are what I've got in the pipeline so far. Fantastic. And then Piper, any book that you're reading lately that you want to shout out about? I have an art of um, In a League of Her Own, which is about F. Oh, that cover's amazing. Yes. Who, Who's it by? By Kaya Alderson, um, who is, um, F. Manley was a woman who um, owned the, I think the, the, um, the Black uh, Negro League team in New Jersey. Um, I can't remember if they're New York Angels or something like that. Um, and, you know, the ways in which she had to maneuver her ownership of, of the team in order to have them be successful. So it's like sports and history um, all at the same time. Business and history. that new Amazon, the more recent Amazon League of Her Own series, really delved into Black women baseball players. And mm-hmm. I thought it was so cool. Mm-hmm. So I can't wait for that one. This could be so good. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Okay, so Cheryl does have a question on here. Um, and I'm going to pose it to you, Piper, first. I think it could be for both of you, so I'm going to pose it to both of you. But Piper, have you started to develop any of your historical fiction novels into film or screenplay? And that's a whole different world. Uh, but any 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 nibbles on any of that stuff for you? I can't say anything about it right now. Maybe there is. <laughs> Usually when something can't be said, that means there's a little tea. So that's a good one. Congratulations if that's the case. Oh, thank you. <laughs> fingers will fingers will remain crossed. <laughs> and again, it there's just not a lot I can say. Okay. You know, it just happens. But I will say one of my dreams is to learn how to write a screenplay because I don't know how it's a very different medium of writing everybody. It's so different. Um and then write a Hallmark Christmas movie. <laughs> that be the best. That's my dream, everybody. Just I that. Love it. Well, Rachel, you have somehow you manifest a lot of things. So I, <laughs> so I would not discount that I happening. Discount. In your Someday future. you will watch a Hallmark Christmas movie at the end. You'll see Rachel McMillan and you'll know. I and we so we heard it here first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the whole t- the whole TV movie thing. It's just it's so and it takes predictable. And... It takes forever because I I also a literary agent, so I have so many clients who have been optioned. But that like yeah, yeah. It, that it, option it, thing. It's like I because because being in the book selling business, it's like once a, a a film actually comes out, we're like. Oh, we were talking about that book 10 years ago. I mean, well, look at Gentleman in Moscow. I mean, Kenneth Branagh, I just watched the first episode. Kenneth Branagh was going to be the lead in that for since wow. like 2017. It takes right. forever. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's something that it's not, it's not a quick process, but congratulations to both of you if things do, if they do get that way. So another great conversation, ladies. Congratulations, <laughs> Piper, on the book. I Thank hope you. the accolades are the same as the last. <laughs> <laughs> See. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really excited for this one, Piper. And I hope it leads to like a zillion more of these. Um, obviously, Canada has great taste. And yes, we, you know, <laughs> by own design did really well here. So yes. uh, we'll help where we can. Um, Absolutely. This is a, this is a really it. fascinating one. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right you. everybody thank you for thank t- you so much thanks piper thanks julie it was nice See to talk to time. you bye bye